And we are live here on the Monster Report Live. Good to have you. My name is Nick Adam Poling, and I am your host. And we're going to bring our our guests aboard in just a few minutes. Um, Monster Reports, a show highlighting those entertaining creatures of film history. So we're glad you're here. Like, subscribe, comment, all of those great things. Join us in the chat. And uh, with uh, myself and my and my panelists here, that I'll have uh, part of the discussion. If we can answer your questions or respond to your comments, we will. And so please uh, join in. And thank you so much uh, for joining in. And and uh, subscribing and all of those things to support this channel. And uh, we've got Godzilla Fan Freaks in the house at the first comment. Good to have you, Everett. And uh, this is going to be so, uh, an interesting conversation. Um, you know, a, a lot of the celebrities that, you know, we we uh, are influenced by, we're entertained by, uh, people on screen and behind the scenes, um, you know, they have such an impact in our lives and we are, you know, we are impacted by their passing, their, you know, the loss of life. And uh, November of this year, we lost Koz uh, Kazuki Omori, director of many of the Heisei Godzilla films and other films that are out there. Um, but mostly he probably impacted us if you're here today uh, because of his kaiju work, uh, Godzilla versus Biolante, uh, Godzilla versus King Ghidra in the 90s, you know, all the way up to Destroy. I think he skipped one of the Heisei films and we'll get into the discussion about that as well. But, um, you know, recently we even had losses, you know, in other areas we had, um, Mr. Conroy, the voice of Batman. We had uh, Jason David Frank, you know, who who was the Green Ranger in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers series. And it's it always is a, um, you know, it impacts us. I think, you know, Omori, that was definitely one that that hit home a lot. And we've, you know, those three that I just mentioned were ones that I felt like impacted us, you know, as fans of those of that IP. And so we'll talk about specifically um, Mr. Omori and his life, his career, and, you know, kind of what impact he's made in our lives. So I'm going to bring on my guest, my special guest, Mr. Kevin Derendorf of Mazer Patrol. Good to have you, Kevin. Hello. Hello. And Daniel D. Mana, Godzilla Novelization Project. Hey, Daniel. Hello there, Nick. Uh, thanks for having me on for this. Yep, good to have you both on here. And we've got some chats we'll get out of the way real quick before we get into kind of how Omori impacted us personally as fans. Thank you so much, uh, Everett. We've got uh, Mr. Ross out there, Jenny Granville. Thank you for chatting in. Biolanti and 91 Ghidra. Um, Riley Roberts, Daniel, have a good suggestion to honor Kazuki Omori. You could dedicate your novelization of Biolanti <laughs> and or Godzilla versus King Ghidra to him when you begin them. So not a, not yeah. a bad idea. Not a bad yeah. idea. A bridge yeah. I will cross when I get to that. Yeah. Um, I assume we mean Godzilla Zero. We might talk a little about that. Of course, it's, you know, um, coming up lots of loss in November this year, like I mentioned. Yes, um, yeah. we've had a lot of, of that in the fandoms of, of many IP. And so um, you know, I might just briefly go go first because I have a lot of, of of discussion when it comes to Omori's um, you know, some of the interviews that I have uh, not had myself, but have had with people who have met him and interviewed him. Um, but the the impact he's had on me, especially with Godzilla versus Biolanti, and then waiting until we finally got some of the other Heisei films. I grew up in the 90s, and, you know, I heard about these films that were being produced in Japan, even seeing the Trendmaster toy, I think, of uh, the Mecha King Ghidra, and thinking, oh my goodness, I want to see this movie, and it wasn't until much later that, you know, we started to get these, and then I was just, you know, hooked on the fact that we had an actual somewhat canonical um you know godzilla for the first time uh with the heisei series and so that you know really made an impact because we had at least one recurring character uh through that uh, mickey sagusa and uh you know i think that the tone of his films changed over time and i think that that was something that uh, as a as a kaiju fan really appreciated going forward from the very dark tone of 85 to the biolanti sticking with that dark tone but starting to get more into the more traditional like showa version of godzilla as he was as he was um you know fighting uh, other monsters not just the military and so yeah that was one of the things that and i especially appreciated bringing back 
Akira Fukube doing the music. I appreciated the artwork, the cover art, the poster arts that that were always um, making these films so much more epic. If you got to see those posters as they were kind of coming out, I thought, uh, yeah, that artwork really sold the films. And of course, story really um, moves the films forward. And Omori was definitely a storytelling, not, not just a director, but a writer himself. And I think that's what um, added to the quality of what he did with the kaiju film. So uh, maybe Kevin, if you take it off, what kind of uh, impact did you did you have personally? I don't think I, any of us on this panel have met him personally, but through what we know and through our interactions with others, um, it, it's it's a loss and it does impact us. But yeah, go ahead, Kevin, with your how he impacted you. Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm right there with you in that I saw uh, Godzilla versus uh, Biollante first on. On VHS, and then I, I saw Godzilla versus King Ghidra and, and uh, Godzilla versus Mothra a little bit later. Before the U.S. got them, they were out on VHS in the U.K., so I had those. Uh, and it was very clear that um, compared to the show, of, uh, you know, series, and even even compared to you know the Return of Godzilla slash Godzilla 1985, that this was a different vibe. This is a different era of, of filmmaking, and that this was kind of the result of a different creative team coming on board and it was very much a, a fresh, breath of fresh air in terms of kind of shaking up the the series and i think there's a reason why kind of default godzilla uh when when toho is is trying to like market uh godzilla stuff like you know what's what's on top of the godzilla hotel in shinjuku it's the it's the early 90s incarnation of the character so um i think that uh it, it really does some stuff that hadn't been done to that point. And some elements have continued on in the series. Some are relics of the, of the nineties specifically, but it's a, a very distinct bold take that uh, kind of uh, was unprecedented at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And then Daniel, um, when you, uh, kind of talk about your your impact the impact he's had on you, uh, didn't, I know you're also like me, you like to uh, hit, specific times in history today's the you know the anniversary of whatever whoever's birthday mm -hmm. death anniversary and of course you know obviously november will have you know several for next year to to celebrate their life and career because yeah. of their passing but i think today was um wasn't it the 80th birthday of kawakita Kawakita, 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 yeah. Kawakita, who worked with Mr. Omori, which mm -hmm. uh, another someone who who passed away uh, after I got to meet him, I think at uh, G Fest 2014. So, yeah, that we're we're kind of losing somewhat of the old guard um, when it comes to this, and uh, you know, and it, it is very sad. But you know, the legacy they've left has made an impact on Daniel too. So, talk a little about that. Yeah, and before I go into that, I. It, you said you just said something interesting that I'd like to highlight, and that's the the fact that um, we're at such an interesting place right now in terms of the history of the franchise, Godzilla specifically, and th the fact that we're looking back on the the creators who worked on these films in the late '80s and into the '90s, and they're the old guard, as you put it. And uh, when really there were Gen, Gen two if you think about it, or maybe even if you want to delineate it further down gen three, maybe, but g typically gen two. And the fact that there are so few of them left going forward, you know, such as the rel relentless March of time, unfortunately, but uh, it's interesting to think that so few are left from Showa. And now Heisei is starting to kind of catch up a little bit when in my brain, I'm still stuck in that mindset where it feels like those are still somehow the most recent movies, you know? Yeah when they haven't been for 20 or 30 years. Um, and it's just so surreal. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, just the fact that uh, just in terms of the Heisei directors, uh, Akawara-san is the only one left now. Uh, that's That blows my mind. Those It really doesn't feel like it should be so. Like, it just doesn't feel like enough time has passed. But it's just, it's interesting to think that we're now at that phase where what th that modern chunk of films, for me, when I was growing up, we're now at the phase where some of those people are we're starting to lose them. And uh, it's a surreal and not a particularly happy place to be. <laughs> um, but again, such as such as how time works. But uh, for me and Omori, it started um, started with this. I, I have props tonight. I have props tonight. This is um, my childhood copy of Godzilla versus King Ghidorah. It's been signed by uh, Robert Scott Field. It's kind of hard to see. 
Um, I would have loved to have gotten it signed by Amori San. I never got to meet him, unfortunately. Um, but he, I mean, this was, when I first saw this, it was probably, it, it wasn't when it initially came out. Uh, it, I mean, when I initially came out on home video in America, I mean, I probably saw it around 2000, oh gosh, uh, two something. I was very, I was very young uh, when this came out and it was, I want, yeah, I think this was the first taste I film I saw. I'm pretty darn sure this is the first taste I film I saw. And it was one of those weird things where I was actually trying to find Monster Zero because when I was incredibly tiny, I'd seen Monster Zero and I saw this movie with King Ghidorah on the front and I thought, well, I don't think it's Monster Zero because it doesn't look quite right. But worst case scenario, my tiny childhood self would get a new Godzilla movie to watch. And that's what happened. And it was it wasn't until a few years later that I read uh, Dave Callett's book that I became aware of who Omori-san was. And I started because, you know, when you're when you're little, when I was really, really little, these were pure escapist, you know, uh, flights of fancy. <laughs> and um, oh, bless you. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, eventually when I got a, a touch older, I became completely fascinated with learning about the movies and the making of the films and the culture behind the film, all the, all the good stuff. And uh, Omori's name was the one of the ones that jumped out at me first, because I remember how much I loved this movie. I saw versus Mothra pretty much right after I saw this one. And then of course his work on uh, Biolante was a big part of my childhood. I saw that one later in the Heisei series, believe it or not. It was one of the last ones I saw for a lot of people. It was one of the first of the, that era, but for me, it, it might've been the last of the seven. And uh, Destroya, of course, all stuff we'll we'll hit on later. But um, I became fascinated by his like the, what a unique, interesting voice he had. This odd mixture of um, kind of uh, hipness, you know, the idea that um, he came off of idol films again. Something we'll hit on later, probably. Um, and his fascination with Hollywood and how he infused that into his films and just an interesting kind of just mixture of elements. And this guy got to work on Godzilla and there was no way, whether you, you know, whatever opinions you might have on those films, there's no way though those films with that kind of influence was it's, there's no way those weren't going to be interesting movies in some way. And um, I became kind of a low key champion for Omori just in my own personal way, because he was one of those directors that I just didn't see talked about a lot. Um, obviously at the top of that list is Honda. Everybody loves Honda and you have Fukuda and you have, um, Kaneko and, you know, kind of that group of people. And then once you start kind of going down the totem pole a little bit, you start finding names like Takao Okawara and, uh, Kazuki Omori and, and folks like that. And they just, to me, didn't, they didn't get their, I mean, those guys didn't direct the original Gojira. I mean, they didn't direct, you know, those classic films that have all of this history behind them. But to me, they are every bit as worthy of academia and every bit as worthy of recognition and discussion because they, they, there's an interest, there are interesting stories to tell there as well. And so I, I got interested in trying to learn a little bit more about him and his influence and, and such. And uh, he became somebody who, even though I never, I never got to meet him, uh, became... Like I said before, I kind of cha I kind of championed him a little bit. I didn't really like go out into the world and say, "Yeah, Kazuki Omori," but I I kept his influence and how he told stories very close to my heart as I got older. Um, the the very unique approach that he had, and I feel like because all these years later, I'm a writer, I tell stories myself now. Every once in a while, I'll pick something out and I'll feel a little bit of Omori ness about it, <laughs> um, you know, and then I'll either say, "Ooh, okay," or I'll say. Mm, better think that one through twice because uh, you yeah, want to make sure I don't do a weird time loop thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, I um, it was a sad moment when I found out he was gone. Um, felt like he went too soon. Uh, and on top yeah. of all like all the, the what you mentioned before, all of the just the pile upon piles of loss that have been happening mm -hmm. um, recently with people that uh, we care about as fans of their work. Uh, it, it, it sucks it sucks, you know, it, it yeah. really does. And, uh, you know, it's, that's why I'm, I'm, that's why I'm glad to be doing this because I feel like it's a good chance to celebrate it and not just be miserable, but, uh, just a good chance to celebrate, celebrate the man, celebrate how he impacted us. So, uh, yeah, I'm, it, it means a lot to get to do this. It does. Yeah, uh, something you mentioned there was some of the influence that brought that, that, um, 
that time era of, you know, the, where he was in the 90s and what Hollywood was doing and the influence that uh, he was able to bring over, not just him, but Mr. Tanaka as well. And of course, Mr. Tanaka bringing him on board uh, to direct Biolanti and then continuing through the uh, the Heisei series. I want to touch on a little of that as we, as we uh, get some chats out of the way here real quick. And we've got Stephen Patrick Lee in the house. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, Mr. Ross, as uh, just for the record, Godzilla versus King Ghidra is my favorite. Hey, say Go- uh, Gojira film. That's Woo. it's a favorite amongst many, actually. And it's funny. Mm. It's it's uh, one of those films that it's like if you just set aside the time travel thing, uh, <laughs> the the. <laughs> the pseudoscience of it or the fact that maybe they just didn't care whether this actually is practical or not uh it was it was fun you know so that, it, that's a stream for another time is what that is that's it so that's its own can of worms <laughs> i say that that's the one that has the rewatchability for me it, oh, de- yeah. it definitely has got the rewatchability going on for it because it just uh goes everywhere monster island film vault is in the house good to see you up? You have to message me sometime. I need to get you on the show. Riley's in the house again. I choked up to hear about Omari's death. Only mm. 70 years old uh, from a horrible disease. Leukemia, I believe. It is yeah. especially sad because three out of the four Heisei directors are no longer with us. And in fact, um, you know, it, it's, it is interesting how, um, like, a, I think it was uh, Takarada was late 80s and and yeah. nakajima in his late 80s and they're you know we we might say that it only 70 years old in some cases 70s quite old for us but actually it seems like a lot of the 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 old guard of the japanese side of things are living long long lives actually getting yeah. into their 90s akira, akira kubo one. just turned 86 i think it was 86 i think he just turned oh. 80 a couple days ago 86 years old that's amazing. And Kenji Sahara earlier this year is now 90. Yeah. Um, there I I'll have what they're having. Uh, right. I, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny that that even uh, smoking not being as mm-hmm. taboo in the Japanese culture as it is here. A lot of them were were heavy smokers, actually, and yeah. they're still living as long as they were. So it's, it's definitely something in the genetics and in the diet, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah. Um, We've got Autistic Lizards. Brendan, good to have you. Hey, Brendan, what's up, man? Yep. Uh, Heisei Godzilla is the most known design of Godzilla around the world. That's why it's used so much in marketing. I agree with that. Definitely was at a point where um, Godzilla was becoming popular again. Leave Claw Studios. That's Yosh. Good to have you. Even Patrick, uh, Godzilla vs. King Ghidra is a very fun film, absolutely. Used to rent on film on VHS at the Hollywood Video mm-hmm. Store as a kid. Yes. Love the VHS copies of those, but we now have it on beautiful Blu-ray so we can see it in its widescreen presentation. And I I am a big fan of widescreen any day of the week because I yes. get what the director was trying to shoot rather than this pan and scan version of what some some technician thought it should be but um you know they'll do the best they can but i think that uh, i'd like to see something uh the way the director mr omori uh intended on it to be seen so all these hey say series back in vhs we all had that monster island film vault danny and i fixed the time travel at g fest really you did how did you do such a thing oh my gosh well um again just uh that's a that is a stream for another time. But we uh, we put our heads together, and I approached. We it was a G Fest panel, and we that he just said that. What am I? I'm repeating myself. We uh, we went to G Fest. We did this crazy panel where I approached the um, the 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 script and the time travel elements from the perspective of whatever happens in the movie is set in stone vis a vis how the universe works. And he decided to script doctor it. So I tried to explain it the way it existed, and he tried to script doctor and fix it and we each came up with different a different approach to trying to make the the movie and the time travel work and i really wish we had thought to record that uh panel because oh. uh um, yeah I have this, uh we'll record the panel as a bonus episode of my podcast okay so there maybe you go can, there uh, you get go. Back together and uh and uh, contact me through monster report at gmail.com i'll put it on the screen here in just a minute as i'm going to toss things back over to kevin uh, talk about maybe some of the Hollywood influences, or if you wanted to go into why he was brought on by Mr. Tanaka, and then how that uh, grew into him directing the subsequent films. 
Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people will point to Omori as being, oh, he's the first uh, director of like the Heisei era, or he's the, the first director that was born after World War II, uh, mm. which these are, these are elements that have uh, something uh, with weight to them. Uh, again, also the, uh, that he was coming on board right at a time when the Japan bubble economy was really booming and you got some of like the most impressive Japanese movies ever made, like Akira, the best anime movie ever made, full stop. Same year as Godzilla versus Biollante. Um, but why he would have been brought on is, has to do with, you know, Return of Godzilla didn't perform quite as well as they were hoping. And uh, at the same time, there was this whole generation of upcoming directors who didn't get their start, you know, scraping and, and working as low level people at studios and then working their way up through the studio system, but instead independent movie makers who got their hands on an eight millimeter film camera and just went out and they started making their own movies. Uh, and there was a whole change in the paradigm there where suddenly the studio system was not the same as it was. And you got this great influx of really creative types that were, you know, maybe they worked in like commercials or, or something like that, but not the typical cinema. Uh, so uh, Omori had been part of the same movement. Um, like one of his, his uh, comrades was uh, Sogo Ishii, uh, who did uh, like Burst City, uh, which if you've ever seen is like a crazy uh, biker movie. Uh, but kind of was a big proponent of the whole like independent cinema. He was a big fan of like European art films and stuff, as well as American entertainment action movies. Uh, and as a result, he just had a really fresh, uh, fresh take. Uh, and uh, people like him, people like Kaneko just uh, really had a different voice than you were going to get internally uh, with a lot of the studio films at the time. So, you know, they, they brought Omori in and then he kind of cut his teeth at Toho doing some, uh, he, I think before that he was at Shochiku. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, he, he, so. he did. He did some movies before that. Um, you know, Godzilla wasn't his first assignment, but uh, he was kind of like hot in the filmmaker it is a similar deal to like when Kitamura came on for final wars it was like oh this is gonna really shake up the paradigm and um as a result uh he just was bringing something fresh to the to the table and he he continued to be like an advocate for uh independent up-and-coming filmmakers his entire life like um, he was, he was on a panel that gave, uh, Shinya Tsukamoto, uh, one of his first awards, um, prior to when Tsukamoto made Tetsu the Iron Man. Uh, it was Omori and a few other people that were on a panel with him that like gave, um, Adventures of Electric Grod Boy, it's like awards and brought uh, Tsukamoto to prominence. And then later on in life, uh, kind of after doing most of his professional stuff, uh, Omori went to Osaka University of Arts and became a professor and teaching is tokusatsu to like a whole generation of of new students like this was you know with within the past 10 years basically that uh he was working on stuff like gunbot with uh with the students there and with kawakita who was also teaching at the university at the same time so uh, i think really that uh wanting to foster independent spirit uh versus this kind of the big corporate studio system um is what was a, a fresh and innovative take for him. Yeah, and uh, that studio system, you might, we might romanticize the the Showa series about having that studio system and having those, you know, the recurring faces in, in what we would see. But in a sense, but it, like you said, it, it may have stifled somewhat creativity. And then when you talk about like that university, Kawakita and, and Omori were teaching at, it's like, sign me up. But of course, we've lost them both to, to take classes with these two legendary creators. Um, you know, how incredible it would be. Mm -hmm. Um and then Daniel, you talked a little about the Hollywood influences. I'll throw mine out there that I, I definitely have heard. And I give a lot of credit to Mr. Brett Hominick. I've, I've interviewed him a few times on the show and uh, Vantage Point interviews has talked to Mr. Omori. And uh, so I'll give him all the credit for the research that and, and the, the stories he's told me about, but talked about the character Mickey Sagusa being influenced uh, by uh, Stephen King's Carrie, 
which I always thought was very interesting um, because wait a second, Carrie <laughs> somewhat villainous, but it wasn't about that. It was about the powers, uh, this, this unassuming young, innocent uh, girl and even the possibility of a, of a, of a beauty and the beast kind of idea of, of her almost versus Godzilla, Mickey versus Godzilla with her powers being amplified um, to a point where she could actually, um, you know, face up to Godzilla. And so Carrie being, you know, able to what she, whatever she did in that prom, I can't remember. I've spent a long time since I've seen that, but you know, having all the, the color red, I'll just say, yes, I just, re I'm remembering it was like, yeah, blood and all this. Yeah. It was uh, crazy. Yeah. But, but the idea there, wasn't it flames too? I don't know. Oh know, yeah. They, fire, yep. and, <laughs> fire and flames and blood. And you know, it's just, it's color King. red. <laughs> Stephen King. Yeah. So anyways, but, um, but then, you know, actually developing her character in a, in a somewhat different way, still being, still retaining that innocence and, um, but uh, being able to track Godzilla and being able to have involvement and all that. But yeah, that was definitely something I wasn't expecting, but what other Hollywood references do you know about in our Heisei series that uh, probably did some influencing uh, Omori's way and Tanaka's way? Well, it's it's hard to to watch the movies he directed and wrote and not come to the uh, inevitable conclusion that he was a Spielberg fan. <laughs> well, mean, sure, that's the that's the low hanging fruit of the bunch right there. Is like obviously you have um, Major Spielberg, and you have from King Ghidorah. You've got you've got that. Uh, you have the uh, the the. Um, I mean, it, there's really no other way to say Indiana Jones. The Indiana Jones beginning of of yeah. Mothra 92. So it's very obvious that there were elements here and there. Um, I remember reading somewhere that he was a fan of Close Encounters, and I don't remember where I read that. I might be remembering something else, but that makes sense uh, considering he has a bright, shiny UFO in one of his Godzilla movies. That would make sense. Um, he enjoyed action movies. He enjoyed spy movies. Um, uh, some of the other influences that pop into my head, and again, some of these kind of bleed into you know, you're not, not entirely sure if it was something that he wanted to do because he adored the films or if it was because it came from on high. Obviously, there's a lot of talk out there on the Internet of Back to the Future Part Two, inspire the success of that film, inspiring uh, the time travel plot of King Ghidorah. There's some people that say it wasn't entirely that. So it's it, it's it's it it's feels more it. Terminator, doesn't it? Than Back See, to the that's future. what I always thought. Yes. It, it feels more T2. It feels more te it's there's literally a robot in the movie. So <laughs> it, it, it's like, come on. Like, obviously he was a, like, he, it's clear that he was into that kind of stuff. So the big things, uh, there's a lethal weapon uh, thing going on in uh, by Alante <laughs> for the little reference that they snuck in. Um, so, you know, action, I want to say die. Somebody, someone else I read work from mentioned die hard. That makes sense as well. Uh, action films, science fiction films, and it's that kind of stuff. The thing about Omori's films is that when you, you know, people in the West will look at that and, you know, say rip off or plagiarism, but it really feels more along the lines of like, you can tell he really wanted to make an alien movie. So that's why that scene in Destroy It happens. Uh, you can tell he, <laughs> he might have wanted to do a certain other kind of film. He went on record as saying that the, uh, the, the, um, the sequence, the the rather infamous uh, Lagos Island sequence was because he always wanted to make a war film. He wanted to make a war film. He cited a specific Hollywood film from the 50s. I don't recall which one. I, Do you remember, Kevin? I thought it was uh, Japan's Longest Day. I think, yes. I think it is Japan's Longest Day. That yeah, I'm, and that's yeah. also, um, you know, same movie that uh, Anno referenced in End of Evangelion. So, you know. Mm, that's right. That's right. Yes. Okay. Then uh, that's what I was remembering. But yeah. And as, as was mentioned before, his influences in cinema came from way beyond Hollywood. He was into Jean-Luc Godard. He was into, uh, you know, French films. He was in, he, he went all over the place. So he, he didn't limit himself necessarily. And it's, I'm not going to say you're, you're going to see a lot of Godard references in a Godzilla movie, <laughs> but uh, the influences there, it popped up in his other films. Um, you know, he, he did films in other, other styles as well. So he, he was he was a cinephile that's the thing is like he was a cinephile director he was a guy who 
cherry picked bits and pieces of things that he loved from like all the influences in his lives in his life. And he didn't limit it to just Hollywood. He didn't limit it to limit it to just homegrown Japanese films. He looked all over the place. And so, like I said before, um, you can say what you will about his films, but there's no way they weren't going to be at least interesting and at best fascinating with all of those influences floating around. <laughs> I think that the kind of sample culture is again part of that uh, boom of uh, upcoming movie makers who are so inspired by what they had either seen in their youth or what. In mm -hmm. Omori's case, it was more things that he was currently seeing. Um, but I, again, if you look at a lot of the, um, you know, if you look at Ano or, or Yamazaki, for an example, yeah. their movies are just full of like, okay, that's this thing from this thing and this thing from this thing, and it's mm -hmm. or you know, George Lucas, he does the same I, thing. You look at George yeah. Star Wars and you can pull out a dozen pieces that were <laughs> lifted from other things. The film yeah. school generation, the, yeah. the first chunk of people, whether in Japan or in America, who were, who went to school to learn how to make movies. And these were the people that were making, you know, Star Wars and the Godfather and Jaws. And I mean, it's, it's that group of people and they were sticking, I mean, you can tell Steven Spielberg grew up with monster movies from the fifties because he homages creature from the black lagoon every couple seconds in jaws. I mean, uh, you can tell he loved Godzilla because of his work on the Jurassic park movies in the nineties. You can tell George Lucas was a student of just about everything from, you know, Ford and Kurosawa to Joseph Campbell. So he, his references were coming from literature. They were coming from age old tropes. They were coming from everywhere. And so it was really the first time that, people who had been raised on movies were now being taught to make movies, which is why you see, I mean, right, but right after that was when the first big rate wave of remakes started happening in the uh, late seventies and into the early eighties. So that's a part of it too. So that's, I mean, that's not just referential, that's repeating it. So it's, it's crazy. Um, different genres being remixed. I mean, just look at what Steven Spielberg did with monster movies and jaws what he did with dinosaur movies with Jurassic Park, take a look at what he did with alien films, the alien invasion film and in Close Encounters, uh, where it's completely turned on its ear. The formula is reversed. Um, well, not reversed, but just inverted. And that that kind of thing wasn't just happening. There's an idea, like this, this completely false notion that that kind of freshness and that kind of approach was only a Hollywood thing. No, no, it was it was it was all over the place. You know, uh, I, yeah. I will say that Omori also had some some literary references. I mean, I, I noticed uh, when he did his interview on Kaiju Masterclass, which mm -hmm. might be his final interview. Um, oh, my gosh, you might be right. Um, he's, like, wearing, he's wearing a, a T-shirt with a, a, a Haruki uh, Murakami uh, novel oh. cover. Um, well, he and, he and Murakami were uh, were <laughs> they had some history. Yeah, they, they went to the same yeah. high school or something. Mm -hmm. And um, then Omori did some adaptations of his work. Uh, yes. So. Um, yeah, it seems like he's a, he's a well-read dude. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, uh, plug for that, uh, Kaiji masterclass interview. If anybody out there hasn't seen that thing, go watch it. It is absolutely fascinating. If you have seen it, rewatch it. It is, uh, ah, it was, it, that was a real treat. Um, that was a real treat to get to hear him sit down and talk about stuff. Uh, kind of good for dispelling some of the, 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 the myths around Omori, the idea, because it's it's well documented that he going into working on the Godzilla films, he wasn't a banner waving G fan. Um, he didn't hate the movies, though, but that they, the idea that he actively despised Godzilla and hated working on the movies uh, kind of permutated over the years. It's completely false. Uh, it's not true at all. And uh, there are still plenty of people out there who I'm sure believe it. But when that interview came out and he went on record as saying, no, no, that's like that was really like for me that was like whew, okay we can put that one to bed we can put that one to bed i hope it opens opens some eyes that's what i hope so go watch that interview yeah and in fact yeah uh monster island full volt nate mentioned here is interesting that he wasn't a godzilla fan when he got the job but mm. like um like a lot of directors when they're given a task they immerse themselves in the ip and and then find themselves a fan as they go along and uh really appreciating um, what it what it can do so we got super godzilla uh, godzilla x <laughs> vlogs in the house good to have you and uh jane meyer is also here thank you for being here so lots of great people in the chat ask us some questions we might see if we can't uh answer them if we can if not uh we we have google so <laughs> but, <laughs> 
And yeah, thank you for that. And but the thing is, a lot of the times it's it's difficult to find this information out unless you've looked at, like you said, masterclass, uh, mm-hmm. vantage point interviews, people who have interviewed and who've really done the research in looking into the background of where you know where they came from, what the story was, and it is it is not uncommon to hear embellishments of stories too. And one of the stories that the Hominick brothers had shared was that um, you know a, a G fan at I think in. 1996 G G con I believe at that time time had claimed he had written the treatment or script or whatever what have you of uh, Godzilla versus King Ghidra and it was completely false there was if there was any truth to it there was no documentation it was just a claim and um, and it was just like a that that there's people who would believe something like that and that um that it would be bought by anyone, but again, you know, show the proof and they kind of dispelled that. And I even think it was a surprise to Omori. Oh, really? You wrote this? Well, <laughs> oh, I guess. Okay. But no. news to me. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he, was, he was even surprised by the, the, the wall street journal article that was saying that the, the movie was uh, anti-American. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's mean, a, that's a whole thing. I mean, I, I even remember watching it and saying, you know, this is just it's it's I don't think that the American military in King Ghidra was exactly, uh, you know, accurate, but I don't think the Japanese one was either. Uh, and so I would say that it's really just the story. It wasn't anything beyond that. In the end, you know, the U.S. won the war and, and we we declared peace, you know, but it was not even about that. It was about trying to give him an origin story, which I think that, um, you know, as far as an origin story, some people take it or leave it. I, you know, am one whom it's not my favorite origin story, but the nice thing about Godzilla being it's its own somewhat multiverse, we can pick whichever origin story we kind of want. Uh, nothing is really canonical in this um, with the exception of, I guess you could say this Heisei series, but even that um, kind of throws some, uh, some, loops um leaf claw studios an artist himself a professor of his used to say art isn't made in a vacuum art that really understands what preceded it and what is relevant at the time really speaks to more people and it sounds more like omori got it yes absolutely and well you know i, I think of like the hollywood system when they're saying you know write me a script uh baby I, it's all dna dna write me something about dna and it's like you know that'll they'll sell you know the kids like dna so right, you know, so they get Jurassic Park, but whatever. I mean, um, <laughs> but I, I don't really see it that way because the it wasn't as if the time travel or whatever, you know, Back to the Future's, uh, you know, hot baby. Let's write something that is Back to the Future. It wasn't even, um, <laughs> it wasn't even somewhat even close to that kind of a script. Um, and even the time travel is kind of just left as a device more than than. Mm-hmm actual plots wait a second back up here you can actually travel in time yes but we're we're not gonna we're not gonna focus on that um uh, maybe one of the things that they could have focused a little is in the fact that we have this thing called dorats where did those come from i mean <laughs> i don't even think omori as i've understood it was really a fan of of that aspect of the film but you know sometimes it's kind of like you you give a little you take a little um you know, there are directors who really push and say, this is my film, but film is a collaborative effort. And he had great collaborators. I mean, he brought back the legendary uh, Akira Fukube. You know, that's fantastic to see. We saw, we saw, uh, like you said, uh, Kenji Sahara making appearances, um, you know, throughout uh, Akira Takarada. You know, we've got mm-hmm. some of that, the Showa era. Uh, back into that so that was that was actually you know a lot of fun to see in those films what else about um his other films uh actually i think kevin you mentioned something about a film that's uh could be or could not be considered a kaiju film yeah i was i was kind of uh uh, joking with the um the the boy who saw the wind because that's an anime movie he made in 2000 uh so it's right at the tail end of cell animation uh, kind of before digital took over everything. Uh, 
And it's, again, uh, like a lot of his stuff, it feels like it's liberally sampling. In this case, it feels like it's liberally sampling from uh, Hayao Miyazaki's uh, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind. Uh, it's this kind of fantasy film about this boy with wind powers, and there's this uh, evil empire that's chasing him down. And uh, but uh, one of the one of the sequences is uh, they're out on a fishing boat, and this giant fish comes through, and they have a big battle with it and kill it, and then able to sell it and eat it. And you know, if you really want to be one of those people that like <laughs> makes a makes a mark every time a giant creature appears in a Japanese movie, well, you know, here you go. <laughs> You know, yeah. it, it, is it kaiju? Is it kaiju? Yes. yes. Is it possible? Uh, <laughs> along those lines, um, Godzilla shows up in Toto Channel, uh, one of Omori's idol movies. So, um, oh, that's right. I for completely forgot about that. Yeah, I, I've never actually seen this movie. I've been trying to track it down. Did I? I think it actually came out like on a double feature with Nineteen, which is another um, Toho mm -hmm. film I've been wanting to see for a long time and haven't been mm -hmm. able to. But um, yeah, apparently there's a little like cameo where they're because it takes place at like a a, a TV channel. Um, so there's a scene where they wheel by a, a Godzilla suit and it plays the march and everything like that. So <laughs> I've heard of that. I have not seen the movie or the scene. Uh, I would I would love to see both. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And uh, oh, when when it came to Omori on on that that film that anime film that you just uh, spoke about, uh, was he the writer and director of that? Uh, I think he was only the director. Uh, okay. So it was based on a novel by a Welsh fellow who was living in Japan, uh, whose name escapes me. But yeah, but I, I appreciate the writer director aspect of what Omori brought. I'm not sure if he did write all of the Heisei films that he also directed, but I know that he's definitely, you know, his hand was upon the script throughout. I mean, yeah. It's so, uh, like with Bialante, uh, that was. Uh, that was a Shinichiro Kobayashi uh, who actually has a sort of similar backstory to Omori because Omori was uh, a licensed doctor who decided to quit and make movies. And uh, Kobayashi was a licensed dentist who decided to quit and write movies. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so Kobayashi had one uh, draft of the script that was very similar to uh, an episode of return of Ultraman that he had written with, uh, with Leo gone. Um, but there were also elements of other uh, competing drafts uh, that uh, were going on for the Return of Godzilla sequel. So what Omori did was he took stuff like the 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 bio sampling and the the monster and uh, Miki Saigusa were all parts of the Kobayashi script. But then there was this whole like Seradian agent espionage thing in, a, in another script that he took and he like, okay, well, let's take this and put this into the same script with this other thing and kind of assembled something that uh, that wound up working. But I always thought with Biolanti, if I did have any criticism is that there are many, many characters. There are almost too many characters in that. Uh, the multiple storylines, I guess I feel like I don't have a problem with keeping up with it, but it's the many characters that it employs and, and each one, you know, having to be fleshed out. Whereas we came out of uh, Godzilla 1985, where it had very few characters, main characters anyways, a core group that we can follow along the way. Um, you know, kept it very small. This one expanded the world very quickly after that. And, uh, but that seems to be the way he, maybe he preferred to have his stories with a very ensemble cast. And in fact, I remember in one of the interviews about him uh, casting, or at least them casting actors, um, that the that the the feeling of oh that's a Godzilla film oh that's a kaiju film wasn't really prevalent in in all of the uh, the actors that um you know that that ended up getting casted it wasn't like this is a career killing move that it was actually very welcomed uh that this is going to be a blockbuster this is going to be a hit and uh maybe actually will uh, catapult my career and i think that was uh you know that was obvious in in some cases um either of you uh, maybe elaborate on the story of Mickey Sagusa being brought on. I think there was, uh, there was some backstory to that. Uh, uh, not Mickey Sagusa herself, but the uh, actress. Uh, <laughs> I'm blanking on it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, wasn't there like a, a beauty contest, a Cinderella contest, something to that, that effect that um, put her kind of on the map? Yeah. So she was, um, she kind of, uh, her first, 
breakout uh, role was in a movie called uh, Princess from the Moon by uh, Connie Chikawa, uh, which is in the Criterion Collection, even though there's not a Blu-ray of it out there. Um, I'm hoping one of these days it deserves a release, man. It deserves yeah, and then, it. Yeah, and she was uh, she was getting um, getting kind of notes uh, for doing some TV dramas. I think like Hana Askagumi was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh yeah just kind of uh made sense as, as far as i understand to bring in for this for this godzilla movie for uh for a prominent role there um in terms of the, like the character itself uh japan was really in this big boom of like psychic stuff uh you got a whole lot of things like kamagura orange road or espy the toho movie um um lock the superman uh, uh the list goes on and on and on of you know psychics were really hot at the time uh same year as um same year as uh godzilla versus king Ghidorah, there was a psychic girl reiko uh so oh, that's right <laughs> um it was just it, it was really trendy uh and i think that was another element of toho being like we got to make this hip we got to make this modern we got to make this feel like a uh, contemporary film um uh, you know we mentioned aliens earlier uh i think a lot of uh, Omori has said that a lot of the um, the stuff with the, the agents like going through and getting attacked by vines was meant to be like the aliens and, and kind of the night night raid sequence and being mm -hmm. uh, people in armor getting attacked by creatures. So in fact, I think Anna Nakagawa, the reason she was cast was uh, simply put, she kind of resembled Sigourney Weaver in Aliens. <laughs> and uh, that was at least again in an interview. So mm -hmm. uh, whether he was embellishing, whether he was joking a little bit, who knows? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I did def definitely see the Aliens influence, Alien and Aliens. Uh, mm -hmm. the Cameron For film. sure. But yeah, definitely throughout. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's interesting how he took this character of Mickey Sagusa and, you know, had a story arc for her that she's not going to just keep these psychic abilities. She's going to have to have, give her something else to do. She's going to be involved in, you know, the government projects, the military, and, you know, eventually going to age out of these powers, you know, and, you know, let the next, uh, you know, group of psychics, if you will. And it's funny, you know, you talk about like the, the, the psychics being the trendy thing at that time. And even growing up in the nineties, every other commercial on TV being the psychic hotline and uh, <laughs> will tell your future and all of that. Could they have possibly foreseen their own demise? <laughs> <laughs> so. Say what if Miki Saigusa was at the end of a psychic hotline, uh, I, I might've actually called. Uh, that would have <laughs> yeah. that been interesting. Um, I mean, she, th that really is an interesting through line for, I mean, not just the Heisei era, but for Omori-san's, uh, you know, chunk chunk of it, those six films, obviously he didn't work on all six, he worked on four of the six, but uh, Miki being that through line, and uh, I, I think another aspect of uh, having Odaka-san play that role was she won an Academy Prize for her role in, um, in Princess from the Moon, um, yeah. I think for supporting actress, mm -hmm. right? And so not only was like, she was like really well situated to do it because she'd been in this Connie Chikawa film. She, she'd made a hit, you know, a bit of a name for herself on TV and she was being kind of applauded for her acting ability. So I think it really all made sense for her to be in that film. She seemed, I mean, she must've seen to them like a natural choice and thank goodness they made that choice. Cause all these years later, uh, I, having grown up with those movies, could not imagine them without her, um, nor would I ever want to try. I, uh, I, I just, I just adore her in those films, and uh, her I have gotten to meet. I have met Miss Odaka, and uh, she's awesome, and uh, yeah, yeah, really, really cool. But it's, it's so cool to see her go through those films, and it's, <clears throat> it's, it is really, it's. I almost feel like if they had made a couple of different decisions, we wouldn't have gotten to see that because she had a significant role in Biolante. She was there in King Ghidorah, but mostly kind of just along for the ride. She's barely in Mothra, and that could have been it. That could have been it. Um, but uh, thankfully, Okawara and the team behind Mechagodzilla 93, Mechagodzilla 2, made the decision to put her in that film, and they gave her a pretty darn pivotal role that extended her... I, I hate to use the word usefulness. That sounds rude, but just like her, her ability to contribute to the story out for the next two films because after she'd had that connection with baby Godzilla and this change of heart where she'd spent these previous films trying to go after the monster and now not due to Godzilla 
changing in any perceivable way, but because her perception of the monster has changed along with the audience, now she's on his side in a way. So she's gone from being employed to fight this thing to now kind of being his human champion. And that's fascinating to me. And then of course, like you said, Nick, she ages out of it. And that really kind of, that that's an interesting aspect of Destroya because Destroya is very much a, it doesn't come out and say it, but it's a passing of the baton film because you have the younger Yamane generation coming up and kind of doing things in the film, those two characters. You have Miki kind of losing her powers and handing them off to uh, another character who still has her powers. And it kind of, I mean, there's the long running theory that there's some kind of uh, subliminal uh, foreshadowing of handing the film, the film rights to Godzilla off to Hollywood after that because that's exactly what happened. So it's, is it, is it a coincidence that the two Yamane kids and the psychic girl that takes over Miki's position, they're all three of them studied in America. <laughs> that's a thing. And so that's a theory. I have no proof of that. So I'm not going to say it's real, but th it is interesting. And Omori did write it. Um, so who knows, who knows? It's something that makes you think. And uh, yeah, that's the thing about Omori San's movies is, you know, at their most entertaining, at their most ridiculous, they, they always make you think about something. <laughs> Even if it's trying to unravel, uh, you know, script nonsense, you're still thinking about something. He, right. he wrote it wanting people to give entire panels of G-Fest to... This is... <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Omori, I have good news for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And in, in the case of, of your your theory on that, on Destroy It, yep, it, you heard it here first, right? I don't know if you've shared it other, other places, but uh, here it is. Uh, what Jeffrey here's uh, talking about growing up on these movies. Thank uh, mm -hmm. Nice to see people who are keeping Omori's legacy alive. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to, as we're wrapping up things here, talk a little about Destroy and how, um, you know, it, it does wrap everything up kind of very nicely. And if it were uh, going to be in, which ultimately became uh, the end of an era for so many um, the last that we'd see him direct a Godzilla film, the last that we would see uh, Kawakita in the film, the last we would see, gosh, Ken Satsuma in the suit, the last we would see <laughs> Akira Fukube doing the music, all of these, all of these last, 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 uh, you know, do, do I even need to ask the question, did he, did he deliver? <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's an affirmative on my, on my, yeah. um, I, mean, I, I would say that that's, I mean, you know, I know there there are plenty of people out there who don't who don't necessarily click with that film, but uh, man, I just love it. I love it to death. I think it's a it's a good example of sticking the landing when the landing was gonna be uh, challenging to stick on multiple fronts. It was gonna be challenging on a story level. It was gonna be challenging on a you know pop cultural level. It was gonna be challenging on an emotional level. And I think it sticks it. I really, really do. I, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's an instant tearjerker of an ending and that's, you know, that a lot of it, you know, got to give credit to Kawakita on that. Got to give credit to Satsuma on that. Got to give oodles of credit to Ifakube on that, uh, for that, that death scene. But, uh, I think it does. I think it, I think it's a nice, I, I I've often described Destroya as the ideal bookend. Um, with the opposite side bookend to me being the original Godzilla, the original Gojira. I feel like if you take that film and you put the six, the other, the next six Heisei movies in the middle and then put Destroya on the other end, you have a nice bookshelf of, uh, of eight films that tell a complete uh, story with an ending that leaves room for more, but doesn't scream for a continuation. And, you know, in all the years since it's been talked about, it's never happened. Um, and I really feel like it is, it's it's a solid ending. It's a solid ending, and it really does kind of complete the through line that Amori started with uh, with Biolante, that fresh new uh, kind of um, up and coming director storyteller idea. An outside studio hire at the time. We didn't mention that. That was kind of a that was kind of a big thing for Tanaka San to make that decision. And I think it I think it sticks the landing, and it's a good way for Omori to have uh, you know closed out the stamp that he, the indelible stamp that he put on the series. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Kevin, yeah, you're, you're right on board with that. Kevin, do you think that, uh, or, or has there been even, you know, documentation or, or um, 
anything on the fact that, you know, we got to destroy a, and then it became that love letter to the original Gojira with its oxygen destroyer, with the Yamane family and all of that. Uh, is this him uh, finally getting to that point where he, where he did uh, fall in love with the character and the story arc and felt like uh, putting that, uh, putting that aspect into destroy to wrap things up nice and cleanly. Uh, I mean, yeah, if, if you go back and watch the, the Kaiju Masterclass video, it's actually when he's talking about like, okay, with, uh, with this movie, I was channeling aliens with this movie, I was channeling, channeling Indiana Jones. And then when he got to destroy, it was like, and with this movie, I was channeling Godzilla. It's like, how, how poetic is that? Beautiful. Beautiful. Love yeah. It. Yeah. And going back yeah, to the to the original, which it's funny how that formula became kind of the thing to do later in the you know Millennium series. Everything's a sequel almost to the original. Yeah. <laughs> Forget everything else. And uh and uh we're rebooting this because this is the genuine uh sequel to the to the fifty four film, right? Um, yeah, you like that last but, one now. This is the one. Now now this next one's the one. Now this well, one's the one. Yeah. Oh okay. worry low-key has a millennium movie that he directed so <laughs> that's uh that, that's, yeah. that's one thing to consider it's not a godzilla movie per se but uh you know the toho was trying to to bring up their their Caesar x uh their uh cho 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 sorry i'm tongue-tied here uh uh ultra star god series uh with grand Caesar, Caesar x and um and jesse riser and the, the third series, Caesar X, uh, is this big superhero, sort of like a Super Sentai uh, or, or Power Rangers, if you want to, thing. Um, but this is all made at Toho. So if you watch these shows, the kaiju are attacked by maser cannons or like when the government builds their big super robot to, to fight the monsters. It's in the hangar that Kiryu was in and, uh, you know, Chujo from Mothra shows up in an episode just as like a, a consultant character. Uh, and then when you get to the movie, that's this crossover between these three series directed by Omori. Uh, one of the things that they decide to uh, to bring out to, to fight the uh, enemy monster is the uh, the Gotengo. So they, uh, Gotengo <laughs> launches, it plays the Ifukube music and it goes into, into battle one last time. And, you know, this is... Uh, Kind of, kind of the the last time we're getting real like practical suit effect kaiju stuff from Toho on on this style uh, because you know the the series on television didn't go on past that and you know we got things like Attack on Titan later but that turns into a completely different aesthetic so yeah. you could argue like okay this is this is the actual end of the Millennium series right here in two thousand five I'm gonna have to check that out I've never seen it. Oh, it's completely worth it. I'm glad that Kevin. I'm glad you brought that up because that was that's worth mentioning. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a trip. Definitely check out as like the, the the actual episodes, but the you know the movie, like you know full on Gatengo. Like you got mm -hmm. it, 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 the little extra Gatengo never hurt anyone. <laughs> Well, no, no, yeah. definitely not. Um, and so we're going to wrap things up. I want to make sure you guys get the uh, chance to plug away at um, your social outlets and anything else that you might have coming up. Uh, Kevin Derridorf with Mazer Patrol. And so where can they find you and uh, anything uh, in the works? Uh, Mazer Patrol on Facebook. I, uh, you know, there's still the main blog, but really nowadays all of the news updates are going to be on Facebook. So uh, if I have like a big article or a podcast or something that'll go onto the, onto the blog. Um, other than that, I'm on the Kaiju transmissions podcast, uh, quite a lot. We, uh, we're recording two more episodes this week. So, uh, I'm, I'm on there talking to those yahoos all the time. And, uh, uh, aside from that, uh, my book is still out there. It's the same book. It's been for five years. So not, nothing new or exciting on that front. Where can they find the book? Uh, it is on Amazon. You can search for my name or look for Kaiju for Hipsters. All right. Excellent. Definitely one to pick up out there on Amazon. So definitely support Kevin in that. Daniel with a Godzilla novelization pro uh, project. Where can they find you and what's coming up? Well, um, if you, I guess for people who aren't aware, the uh, Godzilla novelization project is an ongoing serialized uh, creative endeavor to exactly what it sounds like to create uh, full-length English language novelizations of all the Japanese films uh, based on the original Japanese script. So they're they're accurate to the original dialogue and the original visions of the films uh, presented 100% free uh, for, you know, 
reasons uh, because, because uh, you know, I, I obviously couldn't, I wouldn't sell them, but I literally cannot sell them. But they're presented completely for free uh, for any and all Godzilla fans who'd like to read them. This is a long running passion project of mine coming up on five years of this thing. Uh, it's been tremendously fun and rewarding and I just love doing it. And so if reading the Godzilla films sounds like something up your alley, uh, definitely go to Godzilla novelization project.com. Uh, where the short stories, the full novels, chapter by chapter, and some other side projects like a blog and an ongoing timeline are all uh, all archived. It's all there. Uh, links to all the various other kaiju nonsense I'm gallivanting about doing. Um, I'm on podcasts all the time. I've appeared on met a lot of different podcasts and live streams, doing everything from you know, rambling incessantly about, uh, you know, the backgrounds of monster movies to um, voice acting to, uh, I mean, I, I, I've, I've done a little singing on a couple of podcasts. Wow. I, do all, I do all kinds of silly stuff. I just like, you know, it's, I, I just like to have fun with this stuff. If you're not having fun with Godzilla, you're not doing it right. You know, it's fun stuff. It's incredibly rewarding. And uh, yeah, I should probably talk about social media. If you want to follow along with uh, the GNP, and uh, keep up to date with them. Um, and Nick, I know this is something you do as well. I, I often catalog film anniversaries and birthdays of, of people who are important to the genre and occasionally an exceptionally painful pun, just really bad jokes. Uh, you can find all of that um, nonsense at um, on Twitter, GNP's on Twitter. I'm at uh, Danzilla93 underscore GNP. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. Um, I have a Patreon. Uh, for, that, that helps me get research material and, you know, take time off of work. And I'm, it's going to help me pay for translators one day to help translate stuff and get the project done faster. All that good stuff. All those links are on the website so you can go check it out. Um, and uh, goodness gracious, I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's the list. Is this true? The, yes, I did. <laughs> I did. I sang a parody version of the Mystery Science Theater love theme for an episode of Nate's podcast. Yes. Okay. Yes, Okay, that is out gotcha. there. so we that got exists. some blackmail on Daniel. Gotcha. <laughs> if you ever need uh, to, yeah, show show this when uh, when you, <laughs> you're trying to either I don't know bring him down a notch or or maybe <laughs> you'll, you'll just laugh about uh, it. I can't. I, I can never run for office now. Unfortunately, that's I, you guys have got too much on me. <laughs> this exists. This absolutely this exists. exists. So this check exists. out uh, Monster Island Film Vaults podcast to listen to that on yes. loop. Uh, so, all right. Oh, dear God. So, check out Laser <laughs> Patrol out there. T check out Gon Godzilla Novelization Pro uh, Project. I keep wanting to say program project out You're there. You're fine, man. And if you do get to the point of uh, voice, uh, you know, uh, audiobook version of it, count me in. Not now because I'm all congested. So, bleh. no, I need it now, Nick. Now, now. All right. The recording. Uh, no, I, you know, morning. I'll add you to the list. I, I am going to do audiobooks one day, and I have had several people come forward and offer their services and I will add you to that list. It'll, it will, it's, it's, it's it ain't going to be today, but it will be eventually. And yep. uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Thank you both gentlemen for uh, speaking about Omori. I think it's been great as a little, great little tribute to him. You know, we'll talk about his life, not so much, you know, his passing. That's, that's part of it, but it's, it's the legacies left behind the impact he's made on our lives and all so many Kaiju fans. And I think sometimes you have to uh, bring out uh to the light, uh, you know, to Godzilla fans, they may not have looked, you know, into the background of these of the the creators behind it. Maybe they know a few names, especially the actors, because they're on screen. They see their faces. They know the names. But, you know, wait until the end of the credits at the beginning of the film to say directed by Kazuki Omori. And you're just like, OK, I'm with you. I've got this. I know I'm going to love it because I see that name attached to it. And so, uh, you know, I know I'm in good hands with this. And so, uh, you know, I think this has been great. And I look forward to having you gentlemen on future episodes talking about anything kaiju related uh you guys are both great resources and i encourage people to support you check things out and uh, stick around for just a few minutes after we go off the broadcast here for our proper goodbyes and thank you all out there for joining us for another episode of the monster report live and uh, we've had our guests on here daniel demana and kevin derendorf we're so glad that you could have joined us uh for this uh 
just great discussion. And uh, for all the great uh, people out there in the chats who who joined us and asked your questions, had your points, that's great. That's fantastic. You're you're supporting us. And on, of course, the Monster Report here on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those great social outlets. So continue to support us. And for us here at the Monster Report Live, have a great evening, and we will catch you next time.